Hello and welcome to Muse Jam Session Recording 157. My name is Danny Beaumont and I am a Principal Product Manager on the Adobe Muse team. And in today's session, we're going to focus on Muse 101, so building a website from scratch. I am joined by lots of folks on the Muse team today. Um, Jacob Roberts from our engineering team. We've got Tommy Rogers from Quality Engineering. He's one of our testers. Also Valentina, a real new addition to our team. She's doing interface design with us. And uh, Haley as well, who does our program management. She helps keeps us on track for schedules and deliverables. So welcome everyone to the session today. Process here is I'm going to focus on building a first site in Muse, but you are welcome in the chat to go ahead and put whatever questions you'd like to the team. With such good coverage from engineering and quality engineering, uh, have at it. If you have questions that are specific to what I am presenting, try to throw those into the presenter pod. Um, it's easy for me to switch over and keep an eye on that. So I am going to begin. Uh, as usual, I have a number of resources here on the left-hand side. Um, this is, again, an Introducing Muse session, so there's lots of stuff that we've developed. Back in the day, I used to say that Muse is kind of like a little sapling in a forest of redwood trees, because I'm living in upstate California, but also because Muse um, is new to the table in comparison to things like Dreamweaver, Illustrator, Photoshop, things of that sort. So uh, building out some of these introductory content was really important in the last few years. I'm going to go ahead and start to share my screen, and let's take a look at some of those resources that are available to you. All right. So a couple of those resources. One great place to come is muse.adobe.com. This becomes kind of less important over time because we've actually added a lot of this content into the CC Learn area, which I'm also going to show you. But here on this microsite, this is a site built in Muse that we maintain on a weekly basis. Um, the tutorials area is a great place to hang out. If you are new to Muse, we've got all of the introductory content here, both videos and articles um, for what's new with Muse, if you're kind of experienced with the product. Um, and if you are new, there's some really great content here. So I had had a question, um, will there be assets that are delivered as part of this session? The, the product that I'm going to build is actually based on a template from Muse Themes. Um, and I'm going to kind of use that as a goal as I build out my site from scratch. I probably won't get too far towards a finished product. Um, but if you do want some step-by-step -step tutorials, there are two terrific tutorials that are here. Um, building your first website with Muse and also the mobile design tool. So this is nice because it has a set of assets that you can download. It takes about a half hour to get through all of the videos, but it will take you through all the way to publishing your first site in Muse. The second one, if you're new to mobile design or alternate layouts, the approach that the Muse team takes for designing for mobile, tablet, and desktop, or phone, tablet, and desktop, um, this is a great, again, half hour session that will take you through building out your first site. It has also assets that can be downloaded and worked with. And below that are more deep dives on particular topics as we move along. If you're attending this jam session, you're probably aware of our ongoing Thursday presentations. Um, if you'd like to look at past recordings, um, the events tab is a great place to do that. So I mentioned just a little bit earlier that as of about seven sessions ago, I started recording not only using Adobe Connect, but I'm also using um, another recording tool that has really great quality around sound and video. It allows me to push this up to YouTube so that you can actually watch the content on a tablet, if you'd like, alongside your computer, or a phone, if you choose, or desktop recording. So also, if you tend to have any audio issues today, a great thing to do is swing back in about probably three or four hours. It takes a while for me to upload the content, but you can watch it back on YouTube and scrub to the good parts and skip some of the boring parts. Another great place to hang out is widgets. So we're going to talk about this today, but a few years back we made Muse extensible by way of some APIs that allows the community to extend the functionality of Muse. And actually it was only last December that we added this widget directory to our world, 
But the directory is such a terrific way to find particular extensible components for your Muse site. So each time you come through, there's new additions. This doodaddle is actually a brand new vendor that's providing the content. You can sort by vendors here. You can also go by popular tags or topics. Free is obviously a big one on most folks' lists. Um, but as you look through here, the prices are not that crazy. Five bucks, 10 bucks. Oh, good. We've got doodaddle in the house. Um, E-commerce, for example. Next week, we're going to have a session all about how to integrate e-commerce into your Muse site. And there are so many widgets that allow you to extend your Muse application in that way. So I think that's one of the things that people that are brand new to Muse don't necessarily realize is how, even if it's not built into the tool, how you can extend functionality using this widget world. Site of the day is a great place for inspiration. It tends to be a place for perspiration for me from time to time because not everyone agrees with the choices we make. Um, what we do is look at the submissions over about a week's time and pick three sites that we showcase. And I love this because it's kind of like a way back machine. If you go all the way back to number 34, it can be scary to come this far back. But it shows you where we were with Muse four years ago when we were in private beta. Some of the very original designs that were done by beta testers. Um, and we have pretty regularly done this. Similar to the jam sessions, there have been many, many weeks of sites that are here. Um, so it's a great way to see web trends see how folks in the community have adapted Muse and its functionality to kind of meet those trends by just stopping by site of the day from time to time. Lastly, on the resources page here, especially under templates and widgets, um, we did create the widget directory that lets you see all of the widgets that are out there based on specific tasks that you have. It's harder to categorize themes or templates in that way. So this area in the resources page kind of outlines some of the bigger vendors that provide templates. As I mentioned in today's session, I'm going to be using a Muse Themes template kind of as the goal that I'm working towards for our design. Um, as most of you know, the major heavy lifting often when you're building out a site is not necessarily using Muse to build the site. It's getting your client to figure out what they want and then give you all of the content to build out the site that you're working on. So my life's a little easy here because we're going to work towards a finished site, but I'm going to show you how I would go about building that from scratch. So let's go ahead and jump over to the site that we're going to be building. I'm going to go to Muse Themes. And Muse Themes has been around for a long time. They were the very first template and widget provider. Back before we had widgets, it was just templates. Um, but they've got some really terrific content. The site that I'm going to work towards is this Hearth site design. So it's a real estate website. I'm going to go ahead and preview the desktop version and show you where we're headed here. So <clears throat> as you get more familiar with Muse, you'll start to be able to rattle off how certain aspects of a site were built out. Looks like I'm loading a little slow here. Maybe not. Um, on this site, it's employing a lot of some of the basics around Muse that we will look at today, but let's do a quick review of where we're headed. You'll notice I have a top area here and I've got some navigation. As I come and scroll towards the top, um, actually this navigation is not pinned, so it's going to scroll with the rest of the content. If I were to change the width of the site, notice that certain parts of the site are what some would call responsive, but they're variable in width here. So the background image is scaling to fill the width of the browser no matter how wide or narrow that browser is. So it's cropping one direction of the content to scale the other direction. As I scroll down, notice that elements start to appear here. So I've got what seems to be just a gray area at the bottom, but as I'm scrolling up, you can tell that by the scroll bar on the right, since you can't see my hand, um, it's fading in content. And this is using something known as scroll effects. So scroll effects allow things to happen at the speed with which you scroll a page. And we support scroll effects now for motion, opacity, which is transparency here. You're seeing scroll motion opacity or scroll opacity in this example here. We also support animation and slideshows, being able to page through background images at the speed of scroll. 
So there are some deep dive sessions that take you through scroll effects. It's fascinating. It's not the easiest thing to teach or to learn how to use, but very, very powerful and elegant if applied um, prudently. I'll just put it that way. As I scroll down here, I have um, some areas of just text that have been defined. I also have some buttons. Notice as I'm scrolling here, these buttons are appearing. Um, when I roll over the button, notice an interesting thing that happens here. So this is using what's known these days as flat design. It's not a very three-dimensional button. It's kind of all the rage. But as I roll over the container, notice that not only the container background changes, so it fills, but the icon color changes as well. And that's using something known as a states button. That says that everything inside a container will have its own unique states, and those states will all change together. And I'll show you that today. Muse in general supports um, four different states for just about every element on the site. And that's the up, over, down, and active states for elements. So in this button, I've got an over state. I don't think he's got a down state. So when I click down, I don't see a difference. But perhaps let's see in my navigation here. Notice I've got an up state. The word selling is sitting there. When I roll over, it's in the over state. If I click down, it's going to take me to that section of the site, the selling section. And notice that my active state is now indicated by that underline. So selling is in the active state. About is in the normal up state. When I roll over, I get an over state. And we'll talk about how you can build that out within the site as well. I have a simple contact form here with some nice different states associated. Notice I get that flat button design going on here. But I can roll over contact name, email address. That's actually just a contact form. But it works well as a newsletter subscription method, let's say. I can go into the contact page. And I have the ability to define interactive maps and contact forms here by way of that widget architecture that we spoke about. So let's kind of go ahead and use this as our guide and see how far we can get today in building the site. So I'm going to go back to the main page. And the first thing I'm going to keep in mind, you'll see tiny mind, um, how hard it is for me to remember this. But we're going to look at all of the pages that are defined on this site and come into Muse and start at that point. So I'm going to switch back quickly to make sure that we are all good with logistics. Looks like it's quiet. If you are supporting me on chat, one of the Muse folks here, you're welcome to um, copy onto your clipboard a really important question you want me to answer. And when I swing back, throw it into chat so that we can uh, hand that off easily to one another if need be. If it's all quiet, I'm all good. Let's go back over to Muse now. And I'm ready to get started. So you can tell that I've opened some files in the past. I have a recent history here, and I have the ability to create a new site. Another great place to learn is around something uh, we call Hello in the welcome screen. And it got its nickname from Hello Danny here. Um, depending on where you are in the world, this is somewhat of an experiment. I believe it's only delivered in English at this point, um, and somewhat in North America, a couple other regions. But this is a nice way to see the content that I showed you on CC Learn kind of bubble up within your application. So under New Features, you'll notice we have videos that are showcasing what we just delivered in February. Um, and as you roll back, you can see some of the updates over time. Um, getting started is terrific for brand new users. And then in some ways, tips and techniques is more advanced content for things like scroll effects um, you can learn about. And as you click here, it's going to expand that content. So you get a nice sense of how quick they are. Six minutes usually is the longest. Got a little bit of eight minutes here. But as I mentioned, these are some of the more complex um, topics that we're covering. But that welcome screen is a great place to also learn about the product. So in this Create tab, I'm going to go ahead and click on New Site. And notice that a somewhat Adobe-like familiar user experience comes up that explains um, how I can build out that new site. So it's pretty much no secret, but the Muse team was originally created from many of the folks that worked on InDesign, and before that, PageMaker at Adobe. So we've got a 25-year history um, for some of the folks on the team. Um, and we really, as a mental model, thought that for those that were learning Muse that weren't familiar with a coding paradigm 
the paradigm of a layout application made a lot more sense. So Muse is very much like InDesign for the web. Now you may or may not have ever used InDesign. You may have just learned, used Photoshop and Illustrator. Those paradigms also carry over quite well. But I begin with this idea that says that I'm going to define the defaults across my site. There's a hierarchy to how Muse is structured. And the most basic in that hierarchy is file new to define your site. On top of that are master pages, which have elements that are going to reoccur across a number of pages on the site. And on top of that are individual pages that inherit that master page. Let's take a look at that a little bit as we get started. So here I am, file new, new site. I can decide which layout I want to begin with. Now some folks talk about the idea of phone first or mobile first. It hurts my brain because in my experience, desktop designs for business owners tend to have the majority of information. And a tablet might have that same amount of information. A phone though usually is pretty much a subset of what you're going to put on a desktop design really boiled down to the essence of what your client's client needs on the go when they're using their phone to find something out. So I don't really want to learn about the history of Hearth real estate on my phone. I do want driving directions and I do want a phone number that my dialer on my phone can access. The approach that Muse uses around alternate layouts makes it very easy for you to limit the content that you do put onto tablet and smartphone to only that which needs to be there to offset the amount of load time, for example, the viewer of that site has to deal with. I'm going to start with a desktop layout and I can define a default page width and minimum page height. Muse um, employs something known as, I think it's called soft bottoms, <laughs> um, which uh, means that the height of my site varies based on the content that is there. So we will grow the hierarchy, we will grow the content of the site in height as you add more content to the page. We also have this idea of a footer or a sticky footer. That means that things that are on the bottom of the page will remain on the bottom. If you're a fan of columns or a grid system, let's say you adhere to the 960 grid system, if you're new to web design, it's a great place to go. Um, 960 grid allows you to break pages into, let's say, a 16 column grid or a 12 column grid. It also lends itself to um, the block style of design. So if you are designing for a mobile site and a desktop site and you want to develop elements that can be reused easily, setting up a nice grid system can take care of that. I'll come on into the columns and go ahead and define a 12 column grid with a gutter of, let's say, 10 pixels for this example. Notice that I have by default some margins and padding for that site. There's also an aspect here um, about resolution. And this, I'll tell you first, um, there are things that when the Muse team talks about it, I say forget about it, I wouldn't invest my time. I would have made a mistake around high DPI because my mindset was that it was going to really slow down the production of a site and slow down the viewing of that site for, sites, for uh, customers that look at the website. That's not at all true. What happens with high DPI is as you are designing, if you define a site as high DPI, anything you place that's an image within Muse is going to actually place at 50% of what you originally designed it if you designed it, let's say, 72 DPI. It's kind of a bit of a mind bend there, but the opportunity is that folks that are working on high resolution devices, iOS devices, some of the 4K monitors, for example, um, what will happen is when you enable high DPI, Muse is going to automatically push the low resolution of the site, the 72 DPI instance of that site, to the browser. And then in the background, asynchronously, higher res instances of any images that you've defined will load and then smoothly appear in the browser without hurting that viewer's speed with which they're looking at the site. So I really encourage you to experiment with high DPI and use that as a default. As you design, Muse supports resolution independent content like typefaces, also SVG, which is scalable vector content. Think Illustrator type stuff versus Photoshop type stuff. And SVG and typography, they don't really care if you're standard or high DPI. Um, they're going to always load at the highest resolution possible for your device and browser. 
But high DPI is really good when you have an image rich site and you really care about the quality of those images. I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And I'm now brought into one of four different workspace layouts for Muse. So I'm going to make this a little bigger here. You'll notice here on the right, I've got Plan, Design, Preview, and Publish. And in the Publish drop down area, I can either FTP my content, um, push it to a trial on Business Catalyst, our own hosting platform, or export it to a folder. Interestingly enough, if you're working with a coder and you are a designer and ultimately what you're producing is going to be recreated by a development team, still using Muse to design exactly what you want can be amazingly useful. When you export as HTML, Muse is going to take the time to create HTML, CSS, and JavaScript um, and export that to a folder. If you have, let's say, an image that's used on a phone layout and a desktop layout and that image is taken with a very high resolution camera and you've placed it in a very small size on your design, you don't have to worry about it. Muse is going to analyze your images. It's going to decide if it needs transparency or not, ping or JPEG, as it saves out those files. And it's going to automatically optimize it for high resolution, standard resolution, different platforms, and put all of that stuff into a folder if you export as HTML. If you hand that to your developer, they've got a CSS file with your styles defined, and they've got a lot of exported images that they're welcome to use as they, in a very studly hand coder-like way, go and rebuild the site themselves the way they want it built. All right, with all of that precursor, let's see where we can get with a remaining 46 minutes plus questions and answers um, towards this site. So I'm here in my site plan, and I've got by default a home page, and I've got a master page. Let's go ahead and look at our goal again. Told you I was going to come here often. So I've got a number of pages. Home, listings, buying. It's about what I can handle. So let's come in. I'll double click on home, and I'm going to hit cap lock here. Make sure it's all capitals. I can then hit a plus button that allows me to add a page. In adding that page, I can have a hierarchical structure. So I have a parent and children pages here. Some of that is just up to me as to how I want to organize the site. Some of it has to do with the way that I'm going to dynamically generate a menu here. So I'm going to go ahead and press and drag that second page into position next to the home page. And we're going to add that next page, which is listings. I'm going to get a little faster here. There's a keyboard command, shift command P, that allows me to add the next page in the sequence. That one's going to be buying. I think I don't even have to look back to guess that selling might be the next page there. Oh, look, see? About and contact. I've got contact, and I'm going to put about. Because maybe I like that sequence. So I now have the basic pages that I want to work with. The next thought process you want to go through is in this design, how many elements reoccur across the entire site, and how might just be on one page? This honestly has nothing to do with how quickly your site will load, how quickly people can view your site, because Muse will always do that optimization in the background. It's more for you as a designer, how do you organize content so that, for example, if you're using the Hurst, Hurt logo across the site, if you place it once and it reoccurs many times, you can go and change it once without having to worry about all of its instances. I'll show that a little bit more to be a little less confusing on that. But notice I've got my landing page here, and it's got this white area, and it's got some navigation. If I jump over to the listings page, that one looks pretty similar. Buying, selling. All right, so this site tends to have the same header up here. If I look at my footer for a moment, I think the footer is probably the same across the site as well. But we're going to do a little bit of a design variance because I just want to show off how, um, how things can be a little bit different. I'm trying to make this up as I go along, which is always dangerous. Let's see. All right. So I've got my master page, and I'm going to just come in and give this a name. I'm going to call this um, main master. And I might want to create a second master. We'll start out with main. And I'm going to then double click on the master page because I want to add these elements that are going to reoccur across the site. Now recently Muse got um, much more attractive in the design mode, if you ask me. 
We hide guides and edges of files by default. If you are used to using InDesign, you probably already know the answer here. But if I hit Command semicolon or pull down on View to hide and show guides, I can enable my smart guides. I can show my guides. Remember, I designed that 12 grid system there where I could design within this content. I'm going to go ahead and show up those guides. And what you'll see is right out of the gate, there's some kind of funny lines here. Now, to a certain extent, the paradigm of designing for the web as though you were designing for print works well. But this is not really a piece of paper. This is not a design canvas um, that I'm going to draw in Illustrator. It's a little bit different in our mental metaphor. What we've got is this area here is the browser background. And just inside these lines can be, it is not required, but that's my page content. So with nothing selected on the canvas, notice that here in the upper left-hand corner, the selection state is at a page level. When I come into any of the controls that are here, I'm going to want to always keep an eye on this left-hand page state. So if I decided my page needed a page fill, I could come in and select a lovely shade of blue here. And I get a page, in essence, with a browser background that is a different color. I could get a little bit disco in a bad way. Um, Valentina and I do not know each other yet because she's brand new. Um, I'm going to try to not predefine her expectation of my design skills by doing a really bad job today, but we'll see how it goes. I am not a designer. I'm just a product manager. Um, but having done those basic things, let's just see what's happened. So the thing I love about Muse, I worked in Dreamweaver for as a product manager for a few years. And um, I am not a coder, so I did not get very far. The thing I love about Muse is as a designer, you can experiment so easily um, with the work that you're doing. There's kind of no consequence to trying something out because you know exactly what its results are very, very quickly. So at any stage when you're working with Muse, you can preview within the application, um, which does a pretty good job. I'm more of a fan to preview using one of the browsers I have on my machine. So if I pull down on file to preview the site in the browser, let's say, I can also preview a page in the browser. Um, page is going to obviously bring up just the page I'm working in. Site will bring up the entire design. But by saying preview the page in the browser, I've just gone in and Muse has rendered HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. I can see the exact page, the exact design that I'm working with already right away. So I see its consequences. If I'm curious about code, if I go in and look at page source here, I can see how Muse is designing the page source. I could take a peek at the CSS that it's rendering for that blue color probably. Um, I can see just some of the basic code that the Muse application generates to assure compatibility across multiple platforms, multiple browsers, and multiple uh, browsers, platforms, and devices. There was a third. OK. So back here in Muse, I'm going to kind of undo the blue and undo the shadow, because I don't really want that. Um, you will notice that I have some areas here, though. This allows me to define how much space in the browser might occur before my active page content starts. I then have the area for a header and a footer. And this one's kind of interesting. I'm not sure exactly how often it applies to web design. It's more that mindset that, let's say you're in Microsoft Word, and you want to have a header area and a footer area, and you want to put something that reoccurs across all your active pages. This is really terrific if you're working with a client and you have two different masters, two different top nav areas. Setting where this line occurs will determine where your active page content happens. For the design we're looking at, let's go back here. I would suggest that my header area, I, this is, first off, this has no active page. It's what we would call a full screen desktop design. It's going to span the full width, so my design comes here to the edge. I have no real page. I just have that browser background. So white tends to be a perfect color for that. I'm going to drag down my header area to afford some space here. I want my active page content to start to occur here. And this becomes really relevant when you'll notice 
see listings here. This gray area is going to be on my page content. That image is going to start in the page area, and I want the rest to sit on top of that. So I've got my browser top here, or top of page. I'm going to go ahead and drag that all the way to the top of the browser. And then I'm going to have my little header area drag down a little bit. So my active page content is here. I don't have to worry that this is small because this is the stuff that's going to grow. As we look back on the site and come down, we've got a footer area. So I've got a solid bar here, and then I've got a gray area, and then I have my active page content. Notice as I jump across the site here, if I go to, let's say, the buying page, scroll on down, that content here is the same. Let's do this. It's always kind of fun to zoom all the way out in the browser in a way you hope your clients never do. It messes up things like typography, but this allows me to see across my site. So if I go to listings, notice it's much shorter, but that content there is staying at the bottom of the page. I jump to selling, that's staying at the bottom. So if I drag the bottom of my browser up, like so, let's see, come here, or not. There we go. Notice that that moves up with me. That is considered a footer, but it's a footer that's been pinned to the bottom of the site. If I were to drag it up really high here and do a bad thing, it's layered behind, but notice it kind of disappears behind that content. If I come on over to listings, again, there's a particular behavior to this guy as it moves up. So we're going to try to emulate that, and I'll show you some of your options. Let's stop our pane here and go back to actual size so I can see the actual design. All right, so I want to make room in that footer area. Again, I don't want a difference between the bottom of the page and the browser, so I'm going to just drag up until that browser goes away and give myself some room in this area. Now, in order to kind of make some ground here, I'm going to be honest with you. I've got a library of elements here. I've pulled from that design that finished design, some elements. I'm going to start to use them, um, but I'm going to explain how they were built as we go along. I've got some good basics in place now. You'll notice I've got that white area, and then I've got a container here that's got a nice color fill. Another nice trick, I use a screen capture program. It's kind of getting a little long in the tooth, as the saying would go. They updated it, um, and I hate the update, so it's a couple years old but it allows me to just come in and grab screenshots. This is a real great way to pick up on things you're trying to grab for your design. So I'm gonna kinda of just grab that and I'm just gonna make it a little smaller and copy it on the clipboard and come on back into Muse for a minute. I'm just gonna paste that there. I wanna use this as a reference point because I wanna to start to build out some of the colors I'd like to use in my design. So I'm gonna open up the color panel here not the color panel. I'm going to open up the swatches panel is what I want. So let's see. You are over here. I've got these broken out in their own category lately because I really want to show that these are the closest Muse comes to what we would call a theme or content that can be changed and affect the overall design easily. In the swatches panel, I'm going to go ahead and delete all unused colors. Since I haven't done anything in the site, there's really nothing um, left, so to speak. With this guy now painfully in my way, let's try to move it over here, I'm going to try to grab some of these colors. So just for the heck of it here, I'm going to come in and create some containers. Now notice that when I click off that container, it disappears. This is a new feature we offered, which is to hide edges. I can come under View and show my frame edges. That allows me to see the invisible stuff, too. So I'm going to go ahead and do that real quickly. And I'm going to select these objects, and I just want to come on in, and using my eyedropper, I'm going to grab that nice green. And I'll go to the second object, and I'm going to grab the nice shade of charcoal. Whoops. Helps if I grab the right object. Let's try this guy. Grab that charcoal color. And... That's the gray color. Let's try the charcoal this time. Fill, grab that eyedropper, and get the dark color. 
So what I can do now is add these to my swatches panel. So I'm going to come to the green and I'm just going to come on in and give it a name. Notice that it's by default named with the color value. That's wonderful, but it's also dangerous because if I want to call that, if I want to change its color value, um, I may lose the connection I'm trying to create here. So I'm going to uncheck that and I'm just going to call this um, 01 highlight and click OK. And I'll grab my light gray. I'm going to call that 02 background. And let's invent something else here. This is going to be my O3. Uh, um, main. If anybody's found a standard way to name colors across a, a website that's not totally geeky, that's good for visual designers, I would love to hear about it because I need them right now. I haven't found anything. All right, I'm going to delete that. I don't need it anymore in my life. Next thing I want to do is get rid of my screen capture program here and go back to my design, my goal here. Um, you'll notice this actually is a pattern. So I probably would import a pattern similar to this that could be tiled. I'm doing a solid color now, but that is supported. Um, I'm going to run out of time if I go into too many little pockets here. So I'm going to try to keep blasting through here see what we can get with what we have for time. So uh, I want to recreate this bar first. What I'll do for that is simply come in and create a container, press and drag it on the canvas. I can be haphazard about it. There's this wonderful little tricky toggle we have, which defines objects as 100% width. That is what is going to say that no matter how wide my site is, I want that element to span the width. With it selected, I'm going to come into fill now, and I just get to go select that nice um, gray color that we had seen and apply it. By default it has no stroke which is good. Next thing I want to do is come on in and bring in that logo. So I'm going to pull down yeah I'm going to go ahead and pull down on file to place and I have this folder of assets here so let's just see. I'm going to take a quick look and these are design elements that were probably created in Illustrator and flattened out as pings. Um, this site was built before we supported SVG. So I probably would be an Illustrator and save these out as SVG. That way I know they remain resolution independent and will load very quickly. But there's advantages that I'll show you around saving it out as an image or a PNG. So that's not the worst thing ever. I am going to grab the logo and click open. And I'll just click and release it on the canvas. Now, I have not defined the site as high DPI. So actual size for this object is pretty darn big. When we look in my assets panel, I can see I've added that logo. Let's make a quick change before we get much further. I'm going to pull down on File to Site Properties. In Site Properties, I can go back and change my mind. Under Resolution here, I'm going to say high DPI. Say, yep, I mean it. Go ahead and use it and click OK. Now when I come in and say File Place, that logo, if I just click and release, is a lot smaller. And interestingly enough, here in the Assets panel, it has a 2x. If I come and press and drag on that, you'll notice that it's at exactly 50%. That assures me that I'll be able to have 2x high DPI, high resolution instances of that image. Anything that is placed that has at least enough content for me to reduce it to 50% um, will be handled as a high resolution element, if that makes sense. All right, next thing I want to do, I've got some of the basics here, is add a little bit of navigation. Let's get these guys out of the way. So I want to have navigation here, as we know, that matches home listings, buying, selling, that bit. So what I'm going to do is introduce widgets here. There's a default stock set of widgets that the Muse team delivers. I'm going to come into that directory and grab a menu widget. And I'm just going to press and drag it onto the canvas. Now when I do so, it's in kind of a wireframe mode. It's not very well designed, but it's designed in a simple enough way that you as a new user of Muse can figure out what the heck's going on. So what you'll notice is as I press and drag this object, 
it has certain resize attributes associated with it. If I make it much smaller, notice that the word about has a little bit of space, but listings doesn't. That's because this is uniform button size by default. It's set to be uniform in size. No matter how long the text is, it's very button-like. It's going to always remain the same size. If I change that to uniform spacing, what happens is even the longer listings will have the same amount of space as the smaller ones do. Now something happened here uh, sort of without my mentioning it up front, and that's that it's automatically generated a menu, and that's based on the pages on my site plan. Kind of nice and magical. Um, it allows me to have some nice flexibility. So notice how I kind of purposefully put about in the site plan on the right hand side. If my client changes her mind and says, you know what, I really want about to be more in and I want contact to be more out. All I have to do is in the plan mode, come back and press and drag the about page in its new location. You can see it there in the preview, but if I go back to my master, about has moved to its right location. So generating dynamic menus allows you to have flexibility around your design until that's really solidified, which is really powerful. A new feature we offered is to um, undo a lot of the styling that we give you out of the box for these elements. So it's kind of helpful to have these default states if you ask me. If I come into my states panel, It would help if I put things back where I took them from and I would always know where they were, but I tend to not do that. Okay, here's my states panel. And notice how home has an upstate, an overstate, a downstate, and an active state. Some of the basic keys to Muse are number one when you're dealing with a widget. Always look where you are in the selection model. So when I click on nothing here, I've selected the page. I could set that background for my page again. If I click once, I'm selecting a menu at the very high menu level state. Notice I can affect some elements here in my control strip. If I click a second time, I'm now at a menu item level. Notice I have the fill color represented here. If I click a third time, I'm at a text level. And at that text level, I can come in and change the font. Now, if you've clicked too far, hitting escape takes you up a level in that hierarchical structure and clicking the object again, you'll notice as you roll over it, it's going to let me know what will happen when I click. I can get to the menu item level and come in and change that font. So let's say I want to work with a different typeface. Um, I'm going to go with, let's say, Verdana. No, that's not a typeface. Uh, I'm going to use Lucida Sans. And I can come in and change that. I selected one item and all of the objects changed. The reason for that is by default, edit together is selected. That says that sibling sets, elements that are of the same level in the hierarchy, if I change one, it's going to change all of them. That's really great. I may want to come in and decide that home and contact need a rounded corner. I can do that by unchecking edit together. Another powerful feature I have here is I can come in and clear all styling. So once Muse has taught me how a widget works, I want it to get the heck out of my way. So I can go in and just say, delete all of the fills and strokes that you might have applied there. Now I can come in and change that to the font that I want. What did we decide was a good idea? How about Medulla? Changing my mind. I'm going to come on in and make this wider now. It's awfully small, so I'm just going to use keyboard commands to make it a bit bigger. And then with the text tool selected, I'm going to go ahead and make sure I have those objects selected. So click once, click twice, till I'm at a text level. And then I'm going to change that to be white, which is a bit of a nightmare because I'm on a white background. That's OK, because I can hide and show my edges. I can just press and drag this now into position. OK, that is widgets. That's some of the basics here. Let's go on to the next element that we've got. So this is my header stuff. And if I want to be incredibly lazy, I tend to do this. I'm going to come over and just select some text here and say copy and come back into Muse. And I'm just going to stick it because I don't have much time. Um, it always helps when you're working on a site that already exists. Um, I can go in and use keyboard commands to right align the content. Let's go ahead and stick with the um, silly font choice that I have going on. Make it a bit bigger. 
Now I've gone in and you'll notice that it says contact at hearth.com. I could always come in and copy that to the clipboard. So I've got that on my clipboard and I might change that to contact us. When I do that, I can select an object here and notice I've got hyperlinks that I can play with. Now hyperlinks are amazing. There's a lot of things you can do. I've gotten in trouble um, by hyperlinking to places I didn't know I was really going to go. But in a nutshell, when I am here, I can come in and when selecting an object, be it text or images, I could go in and select that I want it to go to uh, mail to and paste that email address, contact at hearth.com. It becomes a link. I can also come in for that matter. I could say instead of mail to, I could say, I'm going to go ahead and put that back on the clipboard, tell. And type in a phone number. If I'm on a device that has phone capabilities, that would allow you when you click the link to bring up the dialer on your phone. If instead I really want to send an SMS, I can change it to SMS. Um, and there's even more tricks you can do. I've done with the mail to, you can actually cause it to open up a mail client, change the to or the, I'm sorry, change the title of the mail by just embedding it into the path here. Um, so there's lots you can do with hyperlinks. Let's go back to that default mail to and that beautiful blue color that occurred for me here as the link. So as you're working with hyperlinks, I'll come on into this object and select it so that I can bring up the control panel state with mail to there. Notice that anything in the menu here that's orange with little dots, it's kind of tricky. If I click here, I can see all the possible places I can link. I see navigation places. I could link to files that I want to upload. But if I click on the hyperlinks little orange area, I get a drop down area. A lot of folks don't know that that's there. But when I go in there, notice I can edit link styles. In doing that, I can create multiple link styles. I might say my footer is going to have a different set of styles than the rest of the site. I can come in here to my colors and say, you know what? I want the normal state to be that lovely shade of green. Maybe it's a little too light. Maybe I'll go with that main color. But I can change what those link colors will be. I might come in and say, yeah, go ahead and you know, base it off of this default color, but let's darken it up because it's got a white background when it stands alone. You can come in and load those sets and on a per object basis, define which hyperlink set you're going to work with. All right, next thing I want to do is actually add another widget, which is a slideshow widget. So I'm going to come into slideshows. Now, I could work on the footer, but we don't have a lot of time. Let me just think for a minute. Similar to the way we've worked so far. Did I grab that guy? I'm going to go ahead and be a little lazy. Bear with me here. I'm going to press and drag a second instance of this footer set here. So I'm holding the option key and I'm going to drag this guy down. Now, of course, usually my footer is going to look a lot different in design. Let me just try to build this rather quickly. So I've got a footer area here. If you see a white gap that just won't go away on your pages, it's because you did not make sure that the page was all the way to the bottom of the browser. It's a big one that gets people. I'm going to drag my footer to begin right where that box begins. And for my footer here, I'm going to go ahead and reduce the size of the font. Maybe not that much, but so it's smaller and more of a afternote in the design. And I'll just come on in and just place it here. Notice that my smart guides are letting me know when I hit the center of the document. If we go ahead and hide our edges for a minute there, I've got a pretty good looking master going on. I could tighten this up even more and bring it back to the center. All right, I now have my master elements. In order to make sure that this footer content stays to the bottom, what I want to do is select it. And in the menu up here, see that little checkbox for footer? A lot of times if you draw things down here, it automatically becomes a footer and checks itself, which will drive you crazy also. If you don't understand why things keep not moving down on the page, they kind of stay stuck. Footers, though, keep things out of your way. So let's go ahead and close out our master now. Notice that this master now propagates all of my pages, so it is reoccurring here. If I want it to be fancy, which I don't have a ton of time for, I'm going to come in. Actually, let me do that again. 
I'm going to create a second master, so I'm going to duplicate the page, I think. Um, this is going to be fancy footwork, but I'm going to have a second page. And I may decide that I want variances here. So in my other stuff, watch how I do this. It's going to be kind of fast since I figure out what I'm going to do. Um, hmm. Yeah. Uh, what I want to do is make sure that on my interior pages, this navigation scrolls and then stays to the top of the page. So I'm going to give you a little cameo of scroll effects. I'm going to go on into scroll effects and I'm going to say, you know what, I want to apply scroll motion and I want all of my objects to definitely be beginning at the zero mark right here at the top. And I want it to go ahead and scroll and then stop. So the initial motion is going to be one until it hits where this point is. And then I want to set it to zero, which means don't scroll. That may or may not have worked. Let's go ahead and take a look. If I bring up the page and scroll up, one trick here is that my page is much too short. So um, let's just see, I want to test this guy. I've got my main copy. I'm going to drag it here on my listings page. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. And I'm just going to create a container. Notice how my footer gets out of the way. That's because I've told it to be a sticky footer that's going to stay at the bottom of the page. And now when I scroll, that did not work at all. What I want to do, this is why scroll effects takes a little bit of thinking. Hmm. I think what I want to do is tell these guys to have their handles come right down here because that's where I want the browser to stop scrolling. Let's see if I get lucky. Previewing the page in the browser. Oh, nice. It's got a little horizontal action that I don't want. I'm going to disable that. But notice how my navigation is just kind of pinning there. This allows me to have a different behavior for my interior pages than my main pages. Let me fiddle with that one more time. So I'm going to go back to that master, to these objects. And notice that I've got an initial motion in both directions. I want to set that second direction to zero. So zero is like pinning. It sets it to none in essence. I think that won't matter. Let's take a look. All right, we're probably in good shape, or we're not. Um, we shall find out. So I'm going to now apply these to my interior pages. There's the idea of master page inheritance so I could come in and make sure that the header here, in fact, I'll do this for a second. I don't want to bother having more than one logo or phone number and such. And I don't want multiple footers here. So I'm going to delete that and just keep the thing that's different for me. And I'm going to tell the main copy to inherit my master. So it's going to use that main master and put those elements there. And then I'm just going to make this navigation. I'm going to go ahead and cut it from my master because I've got it over here. My home page is going to be the only instance I want that master. I'm going to come in and paste that in place. OK, sorry I'm going fast, but I just don't have a lot of time. I'm going to keep going along here. And I've applied all those there. Let's go ahead and work with another widget. And then I'm going to show you the publishing workflow. So I'm going to go into my widget library. I'm going to go grab a slideshow widget. Um, basic is fine because I know where I'm headed. Thumbnails could be pretty good too. One key to widgets here is they all are combined with one another. Um, so these are variants of the same objects. I'm going to press and drag this guy quickly here. And I'm going to configure it so I don't want, I'm OK with captions. I don't want to counter. Previous and next can be OK. Um, I'm going to move them to the edges really quickly here for this design. I'm going to tell my hero or my large element I want it to span the width of the browser. Get these guys back where I want them. I'm going to place this guy here and actually pin it in relationship to the edge. Same with this guy at the same position in it in relationship to the edge. And uh, I've got my caption content here. I'm going to go ahead and bring it in and just make it a bit larger. And
and I'm going to bring that right up to the top. Now one thing you'll notice, see how things are overlaying one another in a bad way? I can go into my layers panel and control that, but a really nice thing to do in your layers panel, which I didn't put away in the right place, layers, is to create folder groups. So I may have a layer here that I call um, main content. I may want to add a second one that I'm going to call top nav. And then if need be, I may create a third, which would be my uh, footer. I can press and drag that down. And I'll call that footer. What this allows me to do is make sure, let's say if I go to my main copy page here, that no matter what, the stuff up here, by selecting it, is always on the top lav nav layer. So that, for example, let's do that the same here with these guys. I'm going to move all of these to that top nav layer. And lastly, on my landing page, I'm going to make sure that my slideshow here, so pretty much everything else, and grab that navigation, right? We want to make sure that's at the top level because we move that guy. And then with this guy, my slideshow, I want to make sure it is on my main layer. That's going to just allow things to work well here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and steal from some of the elements in that finished design. Now that we've kind of broken out some bits here, I've got the text block. I'm going to drag this guy onto the page. So this is really just a block of text and images like we've done together. I'm just going to dupe these out real quickly so that we can see how this content might flesh out a little bit more. All right, I'm getting some good stuff here. Um, I did have someone ask about libraries and how you work with them. Let's say I loved my navigation and my little header here. And because I work on many different websites for Hearth and I have six different designers and I'm the art director, I want to make sure they always make the header look just right. So what I can do is come into any object that I want, press and drag to select it, and before I do so, in my library here, yours is probably empty. If you click on Find More Objects Online, it's going to take you to all those widgets that I showed you in the widget directory. But I can also just build my own library stuff. I'm going to come in and create a folder and call it Danny Deer. And it will be all the stuff. Let's try to do that in a way that sorts to the top. Yes, we do need the idea of nested folders so that you don't have to do this funny thing to control the sort, but it alphabetizes by default. I can now come in, select this content, and add it to a library, Danny Deer, and I can call it the perfect header. And hit return. If I want to share it with my team, I just select Danny Deer, and I export it to my desktop. Notice that it's a mu-lib. That means mu's library element. When I click Save, what I can do is email that to my buddies, put it on a server. Um, they're not my buddies. They're all the designers that are stuck with my design skills. When they double-click on that object, that mu-lib, mu's library, it's going to automatically add it into their panel there. Now, I've just touched on the design here, but hopefully we've got some basics. At this point, I want to make a decision about how I'll publish. So if I just click on Publish, I can come in and create a trial on Adobe's hosting platform called Business Catalyst. Notice it's going to have Business Catalyst in the domain. That's OK if I'm just working on my own or I want to share it with my client. I can then FTP it if I want to hosting that I have or use Business Catalyst and buy a domain and upgrade that site. So that was a whirlwind. I'm going to swing back in chat and see how we're doing. There was a, quest, a request about importing libraries and widgets. Um, as far as blogs go, we've got a lot of blogging options for you. Um, 
and you have to be a little bit patient. But if you go to the widget library, um, the widget directory, there are a number of blogging options there. I'm playing with an RSS feed way of pointing to any blogging engine out there. I will do this again, although it causes me pain. Um, if you send me mail, danny at adobe.com, um, and tell me you're interested in a blogging tip or trick, there is a widget I'm working on. Um, haven't gotten a chance to produce it yet. It's going to take a month or so longer, but if you want to beta test it, let me know. Is there an effective way to have a 100% width menu? I probably need a little more information about that question. So there is not a way, let's say, to make, let's say we wanted this to be 100% width. We're not going to allow you to dynamically grow it based on the width of the browser. And I'm not so sure you want to. I can have the background be 100% width, but I guess I need more information to understand why you want this to grow in width. Now, there's the world of responsive, which continues to come up. And it's a dialogue we're having on the Muse team as well around how to allow Muse to have all the exciting capabilities it has today while being more responsive to different width objects. I need to know a little more why your menu needs to do that. If you're saying, is there a way that I could scale the text based on the width of the site? There is not natively within Muse. Um, Cookie.com, Ali Pordelli has some widgets that are very simple that when you place a text object, will scale them dynamically. Chances are you have to pick, though. Is that going to be a menu that you make by hand by typing in containers with text that you link to other elements? You can build manual menus in that way. And you could combine it with scalable text using the cookie widget if you wanted to. Tommy says use Sublime Text 2 as well. Who knows what you guys are talking about? I can't jump in the middle of that. Um, any other pointed questions? We're a little bit over time, and I'm going to stop. So I am going to stop at this point. Um, you have one more task that you must complete for me, if this wants to behave. Maybe? Mm. Come on, connect. Interesting. There's this new hide and show feature for my pods, but it's probably not a good one. Let's see if I can go here. There we go. OK. Last task, how well did this meet your expectations? We had a very mixed crowd today. Um, lots of support from the Muse team, so hopefully you got some good questions answered. If it falls below your expectations, you are required to tell me why, because that's the nature of a jam session. I've done 157 of these, and every time I learn from you um, a few points. So Jonathan, great to hear this was useful. Um, if you're new to Muse, I hope we covered it. If you're old to Muse, I hope I covered a topic or two that you haven't heard. Next week's session is all about e-commerce. Be kind to me. It's not an easy one. Um, it is a very similar concept to blogging, though, by the way. And that's taking Muse and a widget and combining the two together. So we will do that next week, and I will catch you a week from now. If you want to stay, I'll give you the link to the Connect recording right now. And then in about two or three hours, if you go to YouTube and look for Adobe Muse, um, we'll have this recording there as well. All right, people, thank you so much for your time. I'll be right back with the recording link.